it's going to be fire, generally fire is going to win. You have to respect the fire and know your limits as to what you can do out there. If you don't have a healthy respect of what the fire is going to do to you, you probably don't even need to be in this game. You're just an accident waiting to happen. It's just awesome, you know, just coming out here and seeing this beast in front of you and you're going to take it by its balls and, and destroy it. Summertime in America. A time to head outdoors and enjoy the serene beauty of nature. But things are not always as peaceful as they seem. Lightning strikes a tree in the wild, and in just moments, the forest erupts into an inferno. For a select few, work is just beginning, and that work can be deadly. In an instant, the season of wild land fires has begun, and the toughest ground firefighters in the country are called in. They're called the Hot Shots. Physically fit, expertly trained, they are the Marines of wild land fire fighting. First to the scene, they hit the forest like an infantry, ready to do battle with the enemy they call the Beast. A hotshot just loves fighting fire. You gotta love it, it's gotta be in the blood, I guess. Yeah, when you see that smoke column, you know, your blood starts pumping and you start to get excited and wonder what your assignment's gonna be. Work can come in grueling 40-hour shifts, smoke stinging the eyes and burning the throat. The heat can reach 1,800 degrees, and the flames can create superheated gases so toxic they'd kill a firefighter in a single breath. Your whole job's a hazard. From the minute you get on a fire, your senses are at max level. We still going to go You've got you know, very unpredictable fire behavior, dead trees that can fall on you, you've got rocks that are coming down hills, uh, you've got snakes, scorpions, Rolling rocks, logs, snags and trees coming down. The fire near Boise, Idaho is a serious one. Left unattended, it could move on to scorch hundreds of thousands of acres and threaten lives and property. With no warning, the winds shift and flames shoot 200 feet into the air. As long as there's daylight, the team will get help from some of the most sophisticated firefighting aircraft available. On the ground, they will cut a line or create a perimeter that completely surrounds the blaze. Cutting the line around a fire is arduous, back-breaking work. A hotshot crew consisting of 20 men and women divides the labor. Sawyers, armed with chainsaws, cut the trees and brush. They're followed by swampers who remove the cut material. The Pulaski's will axe out roots and stumps. And finally, scrapers sweep through to remove anything else until only soil remains. By clearing the ring of all trees and debris, they hope to leave absolutely nothing that will burn. If they finish digging in time, the flames will starve and die once they reach the perimeter. But if something goes wrong, the hotshots risk getting trapped in a firestorm an out-of-control forest fire that will leave the crew no way to escape. We got a couple people that are getting real tired here, and we've had to take packs off of a couple people. An unexpected wind fans the flames towards the hotshots, and they must evacuate to an open field before the line can be completed. As the smoke, heat, and flames intensify, the air support is also forced to retreat. In case of the worst, Ground troops are urged to get rid of anything that may weigh them down. Yeah, Brenda, if anyone's carrying equipment, I just assume everyone just drop whatever they got and just keep on going. As the fire edges closer to the stranded team, the hot shots have to act quickly. When the fire reaches the field, there will be nowhere left to run. Their only option is to beat the fire at its own game 
By deliberately setting a blaze called a backfire, they burn away any flammable materials in the fire's path, creating a safety zone between themselves and the approaching fire. Now, all they can do is stay out in the burned area and wait. We've had a tremendous increase in technologies. Secretary of Interior, Bruce Babbitt. The Air Force is overhead, tremendous radio communication. You can call in the bucket drops. The bottom line is that there's only one way to contain a fire, and that's to have uh, firefighters out there digging a line to contain the fire. But risky business has to be done. Basically, in the wildland fires, you still need to go cut line around them and go in, get in there and mop them up. You know, you still got to do that same job they've been doing for, what, 80, 100 years or so. It is a unique person who sees a wildfire and heads for the flames. The hotshots are made up of rugged men and women, students and park rangers, part-time help and firefighting veterans. The pay doesn't justify the risk, but the position of wildland firefighter continues to be one of the most sought after jobs in the US government. This small group of people doing this difficult, little understood job with their own jargon, their own language, their own ethos. Michael Taylor, author of the book Fireline, has both a son and a daughter on the front lines. They're sort of the French Foreign Legion of America. Tough, difficult job in remote places, little understood by the outside world. It's really hard to tell somebody what you do. Dean Millen considers himself a hot shot lifer. His goal is to become a crew supervisor. You're acting like a normal person, and all of a sudden you'll be gone for 21 days, put in positions that, in the middle of nature, for 24, 36 hours at a time, and expect to work at top performance for that whole time. When I tell people that I fight fire, they just think, oh, wow, that's so scary and so dangerous, and how do you do that? Kirsten Sherb is a student. Come summer, she serves on the hotshot crew out of Susanville, California. It's something very exciting for me. It's a big challenge for me to do. After years of working on a Forest Service engine, Mark Dugard decided to become a hotshot. I don't think civilians really know what hotshots do. Um, I, you know, tell you the truth, I really didn't know until, you know, a couple years ago. Despite their varied backgrounds, every hotshot has something in common. They've spent enough time on the front to know what the enemy is capable of. It's back when I was working on the Eastern Sierras. Fire had taken off about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. It was burning uphill. Mike Allerud has worked hot shots for 18 years and has seen the worst hell a fire can throw at a crew. Before you knew it, we had a wall of flame coming at us. We barely made it out of there, but the fire ended up coming through our safety zone. Burned all the trees, uh, burned a few trucks, an engine, seven houses, and capped off about a 30,000 gallon propane tank. The most heinous thing that happened to me was cutting line up a pretty steep hill, went head over heels downhill. As a kid, Mike Tagium knew he wanted to become a hotshot. Basically what I got out of it was a screwed up back. Hopefully I can get back on, on the saw with my lovely saw partner here and, and be in the front line sucking up more smoke. You know, when we were in high school, you know, these fires used to come up in the summer and kind of, you know, the ashes would be falling over town and there'd be these huge fires. And um, they pretty much uh, hired anybody who had a pair of boots and, and a warm pulse. United States Secretary of the Interior Bruce Babbitt knows about fire firsthand. Growing up in Arizona, he is a former wildland firefighter himself. It was a pretty simple kind of operation in those days. No training requirement. It just uh, sort of picked you up and dumped you on a fire line. And, it was wonderful work, terrific pay, a lot of overtime, and uh, so it was just part of kind of growing up out there. Yeah, so um, uh, you just want us to leapfrog in front of you with food, or do you want us to pick up? And... Firefighters have changed over the years dramatically. Dave Conklin became a firefighter at age 18. 25 years later, he still fights fire and is the Bear Divide hotshot supervisor. When I first started, uh, you came to work and you were handed your equipment and you got a little bit of training and you were told to get in the truck and shut up. And if they wanted you to ask a question of you, they'd tell you. The motivation for the people who do this 
varies widely because of the age of the people who do it. You get 18-year-old kids coming into it with a sense of immortality and a little bit of adventure seeking and not the first clue of what the job is about. You get 30-year-olds who are still in it after a dozen years and who had told themselves they would only do it for two or three or four. You get much older than that, the it, job just beats you to death. It's a very physically demanding job. People have no idea of the marathon nature of it. Hotshot crews will go out and do 40, 45 hours of unbroken pick and shovel work and initial attack on a fire. The longest shift I've been on is a 36-hour shift, and that's constantly working, you know, from the get-go. We were cutting line all day long and all night. On that 36-hour shift, I was hallucinating and seeing things, but, you know, you just do what you can to keep going. Back at the front, as the awesome fire rages toward them, the hotshots must remain calm. They're left with nothing but a bare patch of scorched earth and their instincts to protect them. As the sun begins to set, the hot shots are relieved to find their plan has worked. The backfire they set stopped the flames from overtaking them. This time, the danger is past. But firefighters are not always so lucky. 50 years ago, a crew was trapped in a similar dangerous situation. It was the first time anyone tried lighting a backfire to protect the men, but the results were dramatically different. It began as a lightning strike on an arid hillside in Montana, 20 miles north of Helena. The spot was called Man Gulch. The call came in at 12.25 p.m. on August 5, 1949. Robert Salee is a survivor of the Man Gulch disaster. It was an extremely hot day, very turbulent. The uh, air was extremely rough. It was the roughest airplane ride I've ever had. In fact, one of the guys got so sick he couldn't jump. The quickest route to the fire was from above, and smoke jumpers, firefighters who parachute to remote locations, were sent in. This day, 15 jumpers, most of them rookies, parachuted into the canyon to attack the fire. It wasn't a bad fire anyhow, and it was towards the end of the day, towards the end of the burning period. Honestly believed that we'd have the fire out by midnight. But it was rugged country. And as the winds increased, sparks leapt across the ridge, igniting a new fire at the bottom of the canyon. Crew foreman Wag Dodge, a seasoned veteran, made a reconnaissance trip to survey the best plan of attack. What he saw was terrifying. All we knew was that our boss had, had turned us around and was heading us in a different direction. We started angling up out of the canyon, trying to, uh, to get away from the source of the smoke and it wasn't long before we saw that there was a lot of fire behind us, and uh, <clears throat> it was gaining on us quite rapidly. Dodge saw that the fire was racing up the canyon. There was only one option for the crew. They would have to try to outrun the blaze. We broke out of the trees into uh, pure grass, and at that time, Dodge decided that he couldn't go any further, and he started to light his fire. I think right then is the time that I knew that that we were in serious trouble. With the flames less than 100 yards behind them, Dodge made a fateful move. Trusting his instinct, he lit the grass above the men on fire. What Dodge was trying to do was burn off enough area of ground to provide them with a buffer zone, get the men into the burn area that he created. He didn't really have time to explain the method to his madness. And they were dumbfounded by the fact that he was putting fire above them while they had fire 200 foot tall flame lengths coming up the hill behind them. With all the smoke and the heat and the confusion, these men just panicked. Amid the confusion, Robert Salee and firefighter Walt Rumsey followed Dodge onto the newly scorched earth cleared by the backfire. Exhausted, Wag Dodge laid down in the black zone as the fire passed him by. When the blaze ended, Dodge, Salee, and Rumsey joined up to search for the others. Being young guys, uh, not having too much experience, we assumed that all the other people were okay too. 
I mean, if we could get out, they probably got out also. But then we heard a shout, and uh, Bill Hellman had come over the top of the ridge, and he was very badly burned. All the clothes were burned off the back of his body, and uh, he was really suffering badly. And then we heard Wag Dodge, our foreman, shout from up above. He told us that he had found one other fellow who was also badly burned, and that he hadn't been able to find anybody else, and nobody had answered his calls over there. And that was the first time that it really sunk into me, at least, that um, the guys were probably in really bad, bad trouble, and that some of them surely didn't make it. As you can see, this is about a 65% slope. We're about 250 feet from the top of the ridge right here. Uh, and about 60 yards behind me is where the uh, escape fire was started by the Foreman Wag Dodge. Uh, real rugged country, real hard, hard footing. You can't imagine how hard it would be to try to run from a fire on this type of slope. The Man Gulch tragedy cost 13 firefighters their lives. In all likelihood, Robert Salee, Walt Rumsey, and Wag Dodge probably survived thanks to the backfire Dodge lit. The majority of these men died from seared lungs, uh, the, the intense gases, the heat. Since they were breathing so hard and the, the hot air came up above the flames, that's what they sucked into their lungs and that's where they, when they passed out. Despite the tragic toll, Man Gulch is considered a turning point in the fight against fire. Wag Dodge's innovative backfire became common practice in wildland firefighting, and today it's credited with saving the lives of countless firefighters. But one thing hasn't changed, how you get to the fire. 50 years ago at Man Gulch, the quickest way to the flames was from the air. Today, despite all the advances in technology, firefighters still get to the fires by smoke jumping. Jumping into a danger zone still requires nerves of steel and absolute precision. We were jumping this fire on the very end of, a, uh, of like a finger a canyon, and uh, the wind was blowing across it. Vertical wall canyons about 600 feet straight down. The first couple guys went out and uh, the spotter briefing just before I was getting ready to jump was, remember, if you go long, you die. If you come up short, you die. Any questions? <laughs> While smoke jumpers join hot shots working on the ground, squadrons of aircraft converge on the fire with another mission. The most dramatic assault in the flames below is met by the granddaddy of air heroes, the air tanker. I have never met any who are so interesting or so driven as the, as the people who fly tanker planes. Air tanker pilots make impossibly difficult runs, dumping 18,000 pounds of fire retardant in steep, windswept canyons. These are maneuvers any other pilot would think twice about. Okay, uh, Darryl, I see some fires right down there by the road. They live with some incredibly dreary statistics. In the West, there are about 100 pilots and co-pilots who fly each summer, and each summer, at least two of them, perhaps four, will die. The extreme risks attract pilots with a taste for danger. There was a case of a C-130 that the trees crowned out right in front of him and he went through there and it flamed out two of his engines. Besides a bunch of embers and branches and stuff going, you know, that you had to fly through. Sometimes you can't avoid it because you're just coming up on the fire and all of a sudden you get one little group of timber and they all torch and it puts up a black smoke and a lot of flame and you just happen to be there and it, uh, yeah, it's a heck of a ride. Air tankers can blanket a hillside with retardant to help prevent the further spread of the fire. But when the flames put life and property in immediate jeopardy, 
Helicopters sweep in for a more precise and deadly assault. It's called Hell Attack. It's actually, by all standards, a fairly hazardous uh, endeavor. The biggest problem is the mix of aircraft. You have air tankers, you have other helicopters. You know, everyone is caught up in the frenzy of fighting the fire, and yet you have to maintain a level of safety in that you can uh, do this all without running into one another. Hell attack is ideal for nailing isolated hotspots on the hillside, but firefighting will always be a group effort. The people on the ground do the work. So our business is to put a fire out. But in reality, they do the big lion's share of the work, and we're just kind of a, a tool for those people to use. Your call. I can put you in there. That's where you want to go. Where do you want to go? Right there by the tree. Bridge by the tree. Is off of our right to the where? Is that up above the engine? Or, uh, no, no, no. It's in the tree. Right? It's about 2 o'clock to you. Right here below us, immediately below us at the foot of mob. For people on the ground, the arrival of air support can be a mixed blessing. Sometimes you don't know where the helicopters get their water source, and a lot of people think it's just, you know, from Pristine Lake or something, but sometimes they take the water from, you know, sewage ponds or wherever they can get water. I've had friends on the fire line, and they'll look up and thankful that the helicopter's coming in with a water dump, and it'll dump just gray water on them and just be stinky and smelly and just awful all day long. <laughs> up in Montana. Someone told me uh, on a fire line one day, he said, I actually stood under a bucket drop and had a, uh, had a dead beaver fall on me. I've heard another story where um, someone got, <laughs> someone got um, hit in the head with a diaper from a, from a water drop or something like that. We were on a fire around Michael Jackson's ranch out there, never, never land. Being that that's where it was, it was a high media, I mean, there was cameras everywhere. So we were stretched out along this road, 20 of us, and a air tanker pilot he evidently misjudged the wind or might have had a sense of humor and just nailed us. CNN and all the local news camera people were there and we had to burn out this road for about five or six miles and this film crew followed us and we were just totally covered in pink. Like in any major battle, all the high-tech support in the world is not going to choke out the enemy without a battalion of fighters on the ground. And as the wildfire season progresses, the troops know the war is far from over. An average season boasts more than 80,000 fires, 80,000 chances for the hot shots to prove their mettle and risk their lives. It's been a busy season for the Bear Divide hotshots. They've already logged 20 fires and 800 hours of overtime. And it's not about to get any easier. The summer has been long and hot. The woods and grassy hills are tender dry. The fire threat is extremely high. The hotshots are called to respond to a brush fire started by kids playing with fireworks. But in conditions like these, no fire is a small threat. I'm not sure how long we're going out, but the ship can land us for 24 hours. And I bring some warm and bring some food and some water. Sure. As far as the whole fire goes, here's where we're at right here at this break. Fighting fire is like going to war. And the hotshots know that to win a war, you have to be organized and have a plan of attack. And this division here is on TAC 2, Channel 4. Everything that is involved in taking and holding terrain, all those aspects of strategy work, the business of moving troops, the business of holding troops in reserves. It has an air force. It has an infantry. It has, even by God, paratroopers. All of these things happen out there. A major fire can go on for weeks, even longer. Like any military, to be prepared for battle, they'll need a constant stream of supplies, and they must have a base camp. Wow. 
One of the most picturesque aspects of wildland fire in the West is the fire camp, which is the instant overnight city created when big fire strikes anywhere in the West. It's an amazing sight. A fire camp is a combination of Arab Bazaar and class reunion and D-Day beachhead all going on at once with all of these firefighters, these people who are friends but see each other only at fire. But a summer on the road still takes its toll. You miss home when you're sleeping in a tent for 21 days. That'll get to you. A bed is a very nice thing. Away from the action on the fire front, this mobile army has its supply sergeants as well. On an average two-week fire, the camp can blow through 2,000 work gloves, 3,000 shirts and pants, 600 hand tools, thousands of AA batteries, 14,000 steaks and potatoes, and 42,000 gallons of water for the showers. There's a tremendous sense of urgency, a palpable sense of money being spent, helicopters in the air, trucks roaring, generators running, chow lines working, all of these things all at once. The sheer scope of an arriving firefighting army can boggle the mind. It's not unusual for the camp at a major fire to be larger than the nearest town it's been enlisted to protect. As in the military, long before the hot shots are ready for battle, each soldier undergoes rigorous training. Anyone who is equal to the task is accepted. The crew that I worked on, I was the only female on the crew, and I had respect from everybody because I worked just as hard. Today, more than ever, women have equal footing on the fire line. Nobody tracks the number of women in wildland fire at the seasonal grunt firefighter level. My estimation is that there are between 5,000 and 10,000. The whole history of their experience parallels and leads our nation's military debate about women in combat. At each stage of the game, the women in wildland fire heard the argument that about three years later was raised that women shouldn't be doing this in the military. It's too hard for you. The public isn't ready for women to die in combat. Our division supervisor asked my supervisor, he said, what's it like to have a woman on your crew? And my boss said, you know, what do you mean? He's like, well, we don't have any women up here. Do they work out for you? He's like, my boss said to his supervisor, he said, well, I don't hire women. I hire hot shots. In the West, the wildfire has been a part of Native American life for generations. In modern times, these people have joined the fight to protect their lands. I know anthropologists who say that in the modern Native American culture, firefighting is the new warrior culture. I know that on some Southwest Indian reservations, the medicine men bless the buses before they leave for the fire. In Alaska, the native villages, firefighting is often the only source of cash income for families for an entire year. Prison inmates have also joined the battle against wildland fire. They're volunteers who are considered minimum risk inmates. Many have agreed to join the fight in exchange for reduced sentences. About half the states in the western United States field inmate crews. Some, like California, have thousands of inmate firefighters, and in effect, virtually all of the ground pick and shovel firefighting is done by inmates. The prime example is Utah, which has one crew that is considered a virtual hotshot crew called the Flame and Goes, and they are sort of a legend in the West and their crew t-shirts are trading stock without equal in fire camps. Everybody, tag, go. Copy you. Despite their radically different backgrounds, these men and women share a ferocious common enemy. The wildland forest fire bonds them together in a way that few can understand. As you go on more into the season, we know each other more. We, we've basically become like a, like a family and 
We need to be as a team, always. Everybody knows everybody, and usually somebody has a good friend, you know, that knows, so camaraderie is great. You all have to get along. <clears throat> you all have to know what's going on uh, with each other, just to make sure, because there's 20 lives at stake here. Every day we go out there on the fire line, it's a new fire, no fires are the same, and we look out for each other and just got to make sure you come out all right. The camaraderie and team building experience gained during the summer built the Bear Divide hotshots into a crack outfit. And they are not alone. Hotshot crews all over the country are prepared to see the wildfire season through to the end. But for one team of brave men and women, those sent to Storm King Mountain in Colorado, the season will end abruptly. Nature has its own way of controlling the forests, and man's attempt to control these fires has had some unexpected consequences. We used to do a lot of destruction on fires, and now we're a lot more ecologically minded in what we do out there. You're more concerned about our impact on the environment, uh, which sometimes is probably more destructive than, than the fire itself. Today's firefighters have learned to take their cues from Mother Nature. Sometimes it is more important to let a fire burn than to put it out. Every single firefighter out there knows that these forests are a lot more dangerous than they used to be because the fire suppression uh, that's been in vogue for the last 50 or 60 years uh, has meant that you get these huge, unnatural buildups of ground fuel. Years of interfering with the Earth's natural cycle has created many hazards. When human construction butts up against nature, firefighters use a term, urban interface. It has become the hotshot's greatest challenge. It used to be the classic forest fire. You size it up, you choose to fight it at a natural barrier, a road, a river, a, a rock cliff. But now that they've lost the options, the only place they have to put their bodies and draw their lines is between the fire and the houses. In a small Colorado town called Glenwood Springs, homeowners had been encroaching on the forest for years. It was an accident waiting to happen. Earlier in the day, the smoke had been all up and down the valley, and the, our homes were full of smoke. Even with all the windows closed, we couldn't keep the smoke out. And then driving home from work, as soon as I turned the corner and saw the flames coming down the mountainside toward our street here, it was pretty scary. It will forever be remembered as the Storm King Fire. The blaze took place on July 4th through the 6th, 1994, at a spot named South Canyon. The fire began over on uh, the far knob. Uh, it was a lightning-caused fire, and uh, it eventually burned approximately 2,200 acres of forest land. The fire burned slowly for about two days, and the crews were working to contain the fire, building hand line directly along the edge of the fire. At 3.15 p.m., smoke jumpers and several hot shots from Prineville, Oregon, cut a line along the west flank of Storm King Mountain. Unbeknownst to them, a dry cold front was passing over the mountain, whipping flames up the hill. At 3.45 p.m., the crew gets a call from the smoke jumper in charge. The fire's crossed the main drainage and is rolling. Come on, guys, move it, go. The crew hikes up the trail, completely unaware that the fire is blasting its way up the mountain behind them at 45 miles per hour. The Primeville squad leader was John Kelso. John fought fire for 10 summers, and he'd been all around the country. The only state that they had, the Prineville Hotshot crew had not fought fire in was Colorado. And I've never seen a 27-year-old as excited about going on as a fire because they'd been called to Colorado. Another member of the Hotshots was Bonnie Holtby. Bonnie was uh, 19, 20, 
when she joined first year in the Hot Shot crew. And for us, it was a thing of, we, we were proud of her. But she really loved her crew and loved her job. Knew what she was involved with and knew the risks. At 4.05 p.m., dispatch receives a frantic message. We're losing the fire. Uh, we have a real bad situation here. It was horrible. We could see right out the window watching that mountain explode. At 4.10 p.m., other firefighters safely on the ridge see the fire gaining on the crew below and yell for them to drop their tools and run. As Kelso, Holtby, and the crew run for their lives, a shockwave of extreme wind knocks them to the ground. A few manage to deploy their fire shelters, but the violent winds rip them from their hands. A smoke jumper on the top of the ridge snapped these pictures, then ran to safety. 30 seconds later, as the fire engulfs the forest below, the trapped hotshots are overcome as superheated gases fill their lungs. Ten men and four women are killed instantly. Suddenly, our homes, our belongings, definitely were not important. I think that everybody would have given their homes if that hadn't had to have happened, if those people hadn't had to have lost their lives. 14 crew members gave their lives in the valiant battle against the Storm King blaze that day. They were people with families and futures who risked everything to save and protect others. And they died in the service of a noble calling. I don't think that John would ever look at himself as a hero. John accepted the responsibility of doing a job. He took pride in what he did. He loved his job. And it was just a circumstance of where he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. They had done a job well. They had done something to serve their country. They got um, reward from that, but when they're gone, we can look up to them and know that they did their job well and they were proud of what they did. While the towns of Prineville, Oregon and Glenwood Springs, Colorado mourned, there was a need to remember the ones who died and keep the memory of their sacrifice alive. That is what built out of this tragedy. It's a sense of community. It's a community that remembers, remembers through this monument, the courage, the discipline, the valor of those who died. The tragedy attracted widespread media attention, but true to the tradition of equality on the fire line, little notice was given to the fact that four of those who were killed were women. It was very interesting to me at Storm King that when four hotshot women died, they weren't treated as special cases. The public did not rise in arms and say that women should be prevented from doing this work. They were just regarded as firefighters like the others. We parents built the monument here in Prineville uh, for all wildland firefighters and dedicated to all those past, present, and future. We saw a lot of firefighters down there last summer and it was very comforting to me to see the respect that was paid. They definitely knew who those hotshots were, what they stand for. It would be my hope that it would become a prerequisite for all future firefighters, and even present ones, that they have to go to a monument that's been dedicated to a firefighter and touch it. Oh, 
Valley units reported brush fire. Big Rock Creek and Sycamore Plant campground. Careless campers have started a brush fire. The fire season may be near the end, but the work hasn't let up. At one time, you could be gone for, for three weeks straight. As soon as you get back, you can be called out for another one. And we'll be on the road again, and it could be like that all summer. Things take a turn for the worse. The flames have escalated and spread out. We, we just brought our drift torches, and, and the principle of, of that was we're just carrying some extra fuel for BJ, okay? As smoke fills the air and the end of the day approaches, visibility plummets. Hell attack of the air tankers must retreat for the night. This battle will have to be won on the ground. The hot shots are on their own. That main fire's down there. They don't want it to go past here. And the objective is to tie this, tie it down into the black down there where the fire was burning yesterday. Fire crews have been battling the stubborn blaze for nearly a week. It looks like they could be here for a while. To create a buffer zone for the crew, a controlled fire is lit using flares called fusies. The hot shots are fighting fire with fire. What do you want to do with the escape truck? Drop some fuses right in here. As darkness moves in, the hot shots gain a small edge. You have a fire that's hard to control during the day because it's hot. They usually will try to tackle it by putting as many crews as they can at night. Wilson, go. Bump back a little bit to keep an eye. We gotta go to that far off. As temperatures drop and dampness sets in, fighting a big fire can become a little easier. But working a fire line at night has its own set of dangers. We went in to do some hot spotting, and um, the fire started coming down over the top of the mountain. Some huge fire whirls started spotting out in the meadow, and we ended up having to run from it, and the fire whirls were up to about 200 feet high. We were cutting line at night, Next thing you know, my leg slipped and I was falling off a cliff. I'd say it was probably about a 150 foot drop. Then we had to stop the operation. It was like a big fiasco. As dawn approaches, it becomes clear the hot shots have successfully controlled the fire in one sector. A small battle is won. Finally, two weeks after being reported, the blaze is declared contained. Over 2,500 men and women beat down the flames in an operation that cost over $15 million. When it was all over, more than 18,000 acres were charred. Although it's been one of the worst summers in firefighting history, the hot shots can return home with pride. You just come back filthy, full of dust and ash and tired to the bone. You've been through a long, exhausting and sometimes kind of scary day, but just feeling kind of exhilarated. And with that intense satisfaction that you've really done a day of really good, meaningful work. As abruptly as it began, fire season has ended. Now the cold snows of winter blanket the scarred hillsides. Soon, nature will begin the delicate healing process. The grass and shrubs will start re-sprouting immediately. It will probably take about 100 years before you see trees of the size that we have around here on this side again.
Today's firefighters do more than save trees. They work with the unpredictable whims of fire, sometimes fighting it, and other times letting it rage. These folks are doing a lot of good work, and they're underappreciated. People are asked to make a, a real sacrifices, to be away from their families, take a lot of risks, and you know, we ought to acknowledge that and find ways of expressing our, our gratitude to the people who do this. Hot shots never question where they are sent, and they seek no reward. They only want to be the best at the job that they do. The quality of work that we do, getting in there, punching out the line, and seeing what we have done, it's a great feeling. It's a big challenge for me to do. I'm proud to say that I'm a firefighter and that I can do that. It is a job without comparison. There is no glamour and little recognition. But come next summer, as the forest ignites once more, the hot shots will race to be the first ones on the line, and they wouldn't want it any other way. There's lots of jobs out there that pay a lot more than this, and I wouldn't be happy doing any one of them. It's the only job I'd, I'd ever do again.